Hey everybody, welcome back to the Plays and Fades YouTube channel. I'm your host, Gordo Games. Welcome back to their full card breakdown. This time for UFC Vegas 89, we have ourselves another fight of the Apex, Rebus versus Nama Judas. What is a, a interesting fight card to say the least. We only have one fight over minus 200, which means we have a lot of close lines, a lot of close fights to talk about, and a lot of pretty solid fights to break down from both a DraftKings and a betting perspective. Before we do so, first of all, hit like button down below, subscribe to the channel. We had a week off last week, which... For those who don't know, I am still in school. I am still doing um, a few degrees right now, but getting over 35 credit hours uh, this trimester. So it's certainly nice to have a little bit of a break when midterms are rolling around and stuff like that, but to even to feel more rejuvenated, you know, ready to go in after a week off to a content like that, it, it feels like this card, despite its low name value, is just so much better to go out there and research. And I, and I am feeling better, ready to go, and looking forward to this. Over the next four weeks, we have ourselves three more decent Apex cards, or, or let's say Fight Night cards, and then we have UFC 300, a, a very, very big card, uh, probably the biggest in the past decade, one that I'll hopefully be doing some special content for. But after that, we have a, a week off, and then some fights that won't really compare. So this is gonna be a big build up to the UFC 300. So make sure you're subscribed. Content will resume as normal. I appreciate you guys sticking with me for the week off. And for those who have not heard, I'm also working with Brett Apley still, but this time we're at Establish the Run. We're at a very um, big company, a very good one at that, but one that has a ton of resources. They work with a solver and their premium content from a DraftKings perspective is absolutely elite. I do recommend you checking it out. So with my partnership there, as well as with CoolBet, where I'll still be posting best bets, I'm pretty busy, but there's no better time to be busy. Great time to be a fight fan. I'm looking forward to these fights, and let's get started with a, a, another fight night card. 13 fights to talk about. Let's do this. Get the fight night started with the 10-2 Muhammad Usman versus the 8-0 Mick Parkin. And what is a pretty interesting low-level heavyweight battle? I'm not the highest on Muhammad Usman. He's a guy who is pretty much power or bust. I don't think he has much volume. I don't think he has much minute equity besides blanketing people or only that one power shot because he doesn't have volume, doesn't have the most technical striking. And I do think his chin and defensive grappling will one day be a concern to him. Now, will it come in this matchup? Who knows? But he sees a guy, Mick Parkin, who is undefeated, who is spreading out of the Osmal camp, and who a guy I think has a pretty well-rounded skill set. His last matchup wasn't that good against, you know, Canadian Cal Machado, but really left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth. And now I'm seeing a lot of love for the underdog here in Usman, and money is kind of falling in on him. I don't understand that as much. I completely think that there is a world where Usman's able to either land that one-shot blow or blanket Parkin when it comes down to just being the bigger, more muscle heavy guy here. But when it comes down to who's the more skilled fighter, who I think we winning minutes on the feet, who I think will have more volume and also has the jujitsu edge, shall it turn into a few scrambles, it's going to be Mick Parkin. And I do think that Muhammad Usman is lucky to be where he is now. He, I mean, he landed that lucky shot, or sorry, he landed that one powerful shot, but the one shot he needed in a fight he was losing against Zach Pauga, he had a very, very tired collar in front of him, fought a guy with no takedown defense in Tafa. Parkin can be his biggest test of date. I think that the volume, the fight camp, and just all the signs alarming towards a guy in Mick Parkin. And if the line continues to fall, I will be taking a shot on him here. He's the guy I favor. He is actually the true heavyweight here, in my opinion, too. Actually weighs in around the limit. And I do think that all these things are, are pointing towards him being the right full side here. Drafting side, though, not a fight I'm necessarily too interested in. We have a ton of close matchups. I'm going to be loving this mid-range, that's for sure. But this is one where, you know, Mick Parkin's been content to go out there and pitter-patter to decision. He scored 68 against Pogues, 83 against Machado. Those are not fantastic scores. Whereas I think more upside lands on the Usman side of things. He's a guy who's shown he can wrestle. And I think if he wants to win this fight... It's not in the feet. It's with a quick knockout or with ground success. I think GBP-wise, Usman may have some potential, but really, truthfully, I think at the end of the day, it's a fight that's projected to go the distance, one where I think the favorite is content to win a volume-based decision, and for that reason, not the best fight to target on DraftKings. I will be looking elsewhere. Next up, though, the 7-0 Andre Lima, 8-0 Igor Severino. Uh, two undefeated, very youthful Brazilian prospects here. Very, very fun matchup. Both guys updated my condition. Both guys making their debut, and this one's going to be a banger. I think Andre Lima is a guy with more experience here. I mean, he has those kickboxing belts on his record. He is very technically sound, and he's a guy who has had success because of it. Only 25 years old, still improving, but much better defensively in this matchup, and a guy who I do think has good skills on the feet. Igor Severino or Igor Da Silva, whatever he's going by now, is a guy who's only 20. He he's turns 21 next month, not even dr legal drinking age. So for him to have that guard in Vegas, poor him. But uh, a guy who is very talented, still improving. And I do think that although he lacks the, let's say, defensive abilities that Lima has, will bring a very, very fun matchup. He is very well-rounded. He himself is a very good offensive striker, but because he's so durable and so young and so, let's say, aggressive, leaves himself to be hit. And I do think that when it comes down to technicality, Andre Lima will be the better technical kickboxer of the two. 
But I, I do think that there is a ground edge here for Igor. I do think he has the ability to compete down there. Shall it go down there? I do think he has a wrestling advantage. And I do think he has the aggression to come out here and close this line. I think having Liam at a minus 170, minus 180 price tag is a bit unfair. I, I completely understand that he's a more technical kickboxer of the two. But the guy with more paths, the guy who I think will be the aggressor, in my opinion, will be a guy in Igor Severino here. A guy who I think may be more live in the, in the line entails. So, again, very youthful young prospect who I think does lack defense, but with the durability show, the path to victory he may have here, he is a very live guy. I might be taking the shot here in the dog. I completely understand there's a world where Lima is able to out kickbox him, but with the forward pressure, the threatening of the ground game, the volume, and just the, I, I've said this already, but the aggression of Igor here, it makes me want to play him at this line, and he, he's a dog I'm definitely liking this week. DraftKings wise, because of that ground potential, volume potential, forward pressure, uh, Severino's a guy I really want to play as well. 7.2K for a fight that I do think is close to 50 50. He has the finish upside. He has the volume, especially at this weight class where there, there's a lot of strikes being landed. He has the opportunity to go out there and exceed his expectations and score pretty well. 7.2K, great underdog salary. I think he should go, let's say, a bit sneakier on this slate here, considering there are a lot of fights targeting this mid range. Delima, 9K. I guess he does have KO upside, but without grappling upside, a guy who's content to really be a technical counter striker. If he doesn't get that knockout, he's not living up to that 9K salary. I much prefer the dog here in Ego and Igor, and if he's my pick in the first place, I'll have some of him on DraftKings for sure. Next up, 6-0 Montserrat Rendon versus the 8-1 Daria Zelenikova. If you can see that name in the timestamps right now, you got to give me props for spelling that because that's a mouthful and a half there. Um, but no, an interesting matchup here at 135. Um, two prospects who I don't really project too highly. Um, one where I do have a, a larger favorite here in comparison to the rest of the slate. Uh, Daria is someone who I think has holes, and she's not someone who I'm jumping to play at chalk. In fact, I was actually looking at ways to play Randon because I do think Daria's ground game is suspect. But what she is is a very good technical kickboxer. She'll be the younger fighter that you and the larger one in this matchup. And I think when it comes down to looking for reasons to back Randon, you would be really going out there and trusting her minute winning ability and, and ground success. And, and we have seen the ability for grapplers to let's say, not get awarded the decision. And I think without the really finishing upside that Rendon lacks in a close decision, which I expect this being, uh, I think Daria has the edge on the optics and really is the A side of this matchup. They're picking out who they want to win. It's probably Daria here though. As a whole though, Daria is a pretty solid kickboxer. I do want to see her improve her ground game, but there are improvements for her to make. Rendon seems to be a pretty solid grappler. I mean, brown belt and BJJ, she is someone who has abilities to compete in the ground, but lower volume. I don't think she has the best entries in her takedowns and she more so looks for that physicality. So being the smaller fighter here, that may not play out too well. She's also very hittable. So although I think she can compete, the striking edge is definitely in Daria's favor. As a whole, although I'm picking Daria, I'm not confident. I don't want to play her at chalk because I do think her ground game can be exposed at any time if Rendon can take it there. I just don't have the complete faith that Rendon can do it at a 60% clip. So for that reason, the pick is going to be Daria a bit hesitantly in what should be a lower level matchup to say the least. DraftKings wise, again, not another fight I have too much ownership in. You know, Rendon seems pretty tough. So a, a finish from, from Daria, not really too often. And without much grappling upside, you're relying on a volume-based decision at 8.8K. And does that outscore a Ramos, Quarantillo, Padilla? It really struggles for me to go out there and pick her here. If you're picking a finish win, you could have some leverage. But me as someone who is really hesitant in this matchup in the first place, I'm not really high in her at 8.8K. I actually prefer the Rendon side because as I mentioned, she's not someone who I see winning all the time. But when she does, it comes with grappling. It comes with her ability to take down and pin down someone who has struggled in the map before. So at 7.4K Rendon is purely a pivot GBP play. She's not someone I trust a high clip. She could very well go out there, be boxed up 15 minutes and put up 20 points. But she could also very well expose a huge deficiency in the ground game. And we could look back and be like, wow, we really passed on this fighter with so much ground upside at 7.4K. Uh, a few things to think about. I do think as a fight as a whole, I'm picking Daria. Drafting wise more upside on the underdog who does have that grappling path to victory, although I don't think she gets it all the time. Interesting matchup. Let's move on. Next up, 9-1 Steven Nguyen versus the 13-5-1 Jarno Aarons. It's not really my favorite fight in the card. I mean, we do have ourselves a big favorite here in Nguyen, a guy who had three attempts on Dana White Contender Series, a guy who I don't think is necessarily prime for UFC success, but a guy who has good forward pressure, great volume, good cardio, and who has a solid fundamental ability to compete. Jarno Aaron's a guy who has had UFC fights before. He has not fared too well in them, but does show promise. I mean, he does have a good technical background. He does have a good ability to threaten submission, threaten power, and he does seem to have more finishing upside of the two in this matchup. But it's really a 
complete opposite matchup here. Steven Nguyen isn't the best technically, but he'll throw everything. Whereas Aaron's, I think, is pretty good technically, but won't throw anything. And that makes it for a very tough matchup to call. I think skill for skill, if you loaded these guys into a UFC game online and you are using controllers on them, I think Aaron's is more skilled and I think he wins this fight. But without really me seeing him throw volume or really compete at the pace Nguyen can, I cannot trust Aaron's here and, and pick him out right. And so without raising gun to my head, I will be picking Steven Nguyen here, but definitely not playing him at this price tag. It's actually pretty disgusting to think so. Not that much finish upside on him, although he does have a lot of volume, isn't the best ground fighter either. And I do think the guy with more submission upside is Aaron's here. So I'm really confused in this matchup. I want to pick Aaron's, but I haven't seen enough from him in the UFC or against good level competition to back him here. And for that reason, the pick will be Nguyen. DraftKings wise though, Nguyen being the most expensive fighter slate 9.4K, no thank you. I mean, I much prefer a lot of people, more people around him. He does have volume upside, but Aaron's has been content to fight at a slow pace. And if Aaron slows his matchup down, I don't think Nguyen has much finish upside. I don't think he has the ability to go out there and land takedowns at a high clip. You're hoping he lands another 200 strikes, which is just not a promise, especially not one that comes with as much certainty as a 9.4K price tag should. I much prefer the Aaron side. You're punting at 6.8K, but you're getting a guy who has finish upside. What do you think is more technical? Who does pose power and submission threats? Being a very low on guy as well, I think at 6.8K. I think he wins more than the price tag entails. So for that reason, you're getting a bit of a upside here on Aaron's, but truly a fight I won't, don't want too much part in. I'll mostly be passing on this one and looking to continue forward, but gun to my head, give me to go in. Next up, 13 and two, Miles Johns, 19 and nine, Cody Gibson. Super fun fight. I think the talk of the town has been that Katona versus Gibson fight. Super high pace, fun matchup to watch. And now because of that loss that was entertaining enough to get a contract, we have Cody Gibson back in the UFC against Miles Johns. Miles Johns, I think, is an extremely technical striker, uh, good counter strike, good ability to move, ability to mix in takedowns as well, and a overall really fundamentally sound fighter. I really like Miles Johns. I've backed him many times before. But He's getting an interesting matchup here, and I, I don't know if the line really reflects the styles. I think this line more so reflects the skill set. I think when we look at, again, comparing the two guys, I think Miles Johns might have more power. I think he'll have better technicality and better footwork. But in this particular matchup, that may not matter because you're going to get a guy in Cody Gibson who will throw everything at you, who will walk forward, be extremely durable, and make you push a pace. And when it comes down to having the larger fighter here in Cody Gibson, the guy who I think has better cardio here in Cody Gibson, and the guy who will land more volume at a higher clip, I don't think Gibson should, should be an underdog here and he'll be my pick to win. Now, money has committed on him. I'm not the only one to think this way, but I do think Miles Johns is, is getting a very tough matchup here. He's not getting someone he can circle off to the side and counter-strike the whole time. He's getting someone who will force him to fight at a very, very high pace and force him to try to find that power shot. And I think that Cody Gibson has shown the durability cardio and pressure to avoid that, making him a preferred spot here. I do think Cody Gibson has the, the size, the, the length, the reach, but more so the volume and aggression to win this matchup. And he'll be my pick as an underdog here. And also a great underdog to target on DraftKings. 8K, 8.2, they're right in the middle here. I think Miles Johns, you know, can, do I see him going out there landing takedowns at a high clip? Not so much. He hasn't been historically a great DraftKings scorer. So I much more prefer the dog here, 8K. Cody Gibson has scored 66 points in a decision loss. He wins that fight, 96 there. He's also been a guy who's put up 126 before. His ceiling's certainly higher than John's and is a guy who will fight at a high enough pace that allows you to have some good leverage at 8K. I do think he'll be decently popular. So um, if you're looking to be a different, maybe not get away from this one, but still a very solid underdog who I don't think should be an underdog here is Cody Gibson. I like his volume, I like his pressure, and I like his size to overall win this matchup and potentially put a good, a good score on DraftKings as well. We'll probably get there with a bet at plus money as well. Next up, 16 and five, Ricardo Ramos, 28 and 11, Yulina Rosa. Super, super fun matchup. But two guys who are just not trustworthy trustworthy at all, actually. Uh, Ricardo Ramos has put himself in some precarious situations. He does have a very good overall skill set, both offensively and defensively, but um, has put himself in spots where he shouldn't really be. I mean, you shouldn't always be getting subbed by Charles Jordan as much as I love Charles Jordan. His chin's been caught before, but what he has in front of him is a guy with all the offensive tools in the world in Julian Rosa, but none of the defensive tools. Julian Rosa skill set with Max Holloway's chin is one of those, uh, again, incredible mythical creatures. Cause I do think he is huge for this division. He's a ton of power and a very good opportunistic submission game. But what he lacks really is striking defense and durability. And those are two things you don't want to really lack because he absorbs a lot of damage. He'll continue to go forward and you're allowing your opponent the ability to catch you and knock your lights out. And I do think that is a path to victory for Ramos here. When it comes down to overall skill sets, these guys had if he goes right chin parity, I would take Arosa because I do think he's a guy who is 
extremely undervalued by the market all the time because of how good he is offensively. And it's not like Ramos is super trustworthy either. And I, I think it's going to come down to hindsight, really not playing this into factor. Both these guys are not that durable. Both these guys are not that trustworthy. So you're really kind of throwing darts here. And if that's the case, I want the guy with a more proven offensive skill set at an underdog price tag. And I do think Julian Rose is a very live underdog here. Now, if he gets sparked in the first round, I'm not too surprised. It's happened before. His durability and defense is not there. But on the feet, the guy who thinks to land the more powerful shots with a larger frame, longer reach, and really just solid power behind them is Yulina Rosa. And I do think he's a threat to finish this fight at all times. I'm going to pick him as an underdog here, surprising myself by saying that. DraftKings wise, though, 7.3K, maybe one of my favorite underdogs in the entire slate. He has shown the ability to go out there and win fights and score 96 against Dewodu, 112 against Peterson, 102 against Charles Jordan, 131 against Nate Landwehr. The guy has a very high ceiling, very high pace, and his offensive skill set is no joke, but he is that GBP play, because if he loses, he puts up nothing. In his last three losses, he's put up six points, four points, and four points. First of all, on the dot is impressive, but also not the best scores. All three of them have come by first round knockout. That's a path. And because of that volatility, Ramos is also a pretty good option up top, 8.9K. When he's won fights, he scored 101, 98, 106. Those his last three wins, fighting at a good pace and, and scoring well in the process. Ramos also has taken upside, which really heightens his ceiling even more. But I do think that Arosa has 7.3K is massive value, especially because he could look like a hindsight favorite if his chin holds up. And for that reason, I'm picking him. Uh, I'm trusting him, which is scary to do, but also uh, looking for his upside, which is 7.3K is immense. And the prelim headliner, the 16-6 Trey Ogden versus the 20-7 Kurt Hollibau. Uh, I think it's a pretty fun matchup. Trey Ogden is a guy who is really hard to get a read on. Um, not the best anywhere. Uh, you know, he struggles on the feet against Vaughn. got outstruck by Jordan Leavitt. Uh, but he's also had the ability to slow down fights and beat some great prospects. Like Daniel Zellhuber showed some ground success uh, against Mata last one. The guy has an overall good skill set. And he's facing the 37-year-old Kurt Hollibau, who's getting another stint here. A guy who's a fun fighter to... to to watch, but who bring two opposite skill sets. Trey Ogden is a slow paced guy who wants to really fight the fight at his own pace, drain the energy out of people and confuse them, right? The same way he did with Zell Huber, as I mentioned before, but who has the ability to be well rounded enough to compete in all areas, but not really excel in them. Whereas Kurt Hollibau wants to go out there and kill you, right? He wants to snatch a neck. He wants to fight the defending positions. He can be countered, he can be hit, but he's tough, he's fun, and he, he's able to go out there and put his body on the line for success. And I think when it comes down to comparing the two, the better minute winner here might be Trey Ogden. But the guy from our finish upside is Kurt Hollibau. I mean, he's super dangerous, especially on the mat. We've seen Trey Ogden submit it before, and Kurt Hollibau has the ability to go out there and snatch something up. But I like the improvements I'm seeing from Trey Ogden. And because of that, I do think this is a very, very close fight to call. I'm very tempted in the Hollibau side just because of how dangerous he may be. But I think I'm going to side with Trey Ogden. I like his minute winning ability. I do think he's going to be the crisper striker of the two. And as long as he can survive the offensive onslaught of Hall Hallabout, he's more minute winning upside. As long as he can stay safe in soft position, I do think he's the larger fighter with more physical attributes. And I do think he's making improvements. We've seen him compete at the UFC level recently. I'm picking Trey Ogden here, but very tentatively. Where the line is as it is now, though, it makes it for a dog play on DraftKings. 7.7K, Harlebao is a guy who has been in the UFC before. And although he's only got one win, he put up 101 against Austin Hubbard in that spot. Before that, he was fighting the likes of Thiago Moises, Shane Burgos, Rowney Barcelos. Like, he's fought some good competition. But um, I, I think in this matchup, the guy at the higher ceiling, more finish upside, is Harlebao. So at 7.7K, he is my preferred play on DraftKings. Although, gun to my head, I am picking Trey Ogden. Close matchup. Should be a fun one. It just depends who gets off in their game plan. Next up, on to our six-fight main card. We have the 8-1 Luis Pajelas making his debut against the 15-5 Fernando Padilla. One of my favorite fights in the entire card. I think it's going to be an extremely fun matchup for as long as it lasts. It's one where I'm really struggling to get a solid read on it, but I do think that no matter who I think wins, it's going to be a fun one. It's going to be a fun one for the fans, and I do think the fans are going to be the winner on that one, putting it that way. Uh, when it comes down to picking a winner, I think I have to look at the way this fight's going to go. I do think it's going to be a 15-minute slugfest. Shall it go that far? Because we have two guys who are offensive-minded on the feet, who are willing to throw down, and who, although don't have the best striking defense, are extremely tough, extremely durable. Again, a very close matchup, one where I think it's going to be hard-fought and entertaining. But come to my head, I'm going to pick Fernando Padilla here. He is the favorite, no hot take. But he's just a guy with more attributes. He's going to have a height and reach advantage, 7-inch uh, reach advantage on the feet, and has shown the ability to compete on the ground as well as some dangerous submissions. He also has a ton of power, and, and although we have seen Hello have a Carazon de Leon, like have a heart of a lion, he can be hit, and that's not something you want to have against Padilla, who is super tough. We're also really getting a shorter price second Padilla, who just was stifled by Kyle Nelson last time out, 
And I do think that this was a guy with a lot of hype behind him for good reason. He is extremely powerful in the feet, has good volume, but also a lot of power. And it makes it for a, a very fun matchup. I would not be su surprised if Puello is able to push forward lane volume, but the, the more powerful shots, the longer frame, and the better technical boxing, in my opinion, is Fernando Padilla, who also the ability to compete in the ground. I think it's a phenomenal spot. I think it's a phenomenal fight, but I'm taking Padilla here. It should be a fun one. DraftKings wise, another fight I kind of want to get to because it can be fought at such a high pace and the power upside there for Padilla. And Padilla's one winning against Rosa scored 108. I do think that's replicable here against a guy who has poor striking defense, but if this turns into a 15 minute kickboxing affair, this fight can be fought at a high pace. And although it may not score the same as a Quarantillo or a Ramos or a Shabazian, this fight could be fought at such a high pace. You're getting a ton of strikes. You're getting knockdown potential. And 8.7K could be a good leverage spot as well. I also think that Pahalo, his path to victory also comes with forward pressure boxing, landing a ton of strikes. So he is also live at 7.5K. What I'm trying to say is the game script for this one has some good upside. I do think this is a fight you're looking to target on DraftKings. Ton of strikes, ton of volume. I do think this would be a fun one. Another one I want on DraftKings, but I am picking Fernando Padilla. And then we get to this one here. Uh, fair warning to everybody. This might be a bit of a biased breakdown. I am one of the biggest Billy Q fans for, for many reasons, um, but just uh, a guy who I always want to look to back, a guy who I'll always be cheering for. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Billy Quarantillo is, is a phenomenal pace fighter. One of the, has one of those styles that you always want to cheer for because he's always looking to break his opponents and he does a very good job of that. Cardio machine. Had the pleasure of watching him in Nashville and also a guy who helped me out with my tickets there. A guy who's just super fun to watch. Will be completely relentless on you, will look to break you. And he's done that against some good level of competition. Damon Jackson and Alex Hernandez. Solid boxing, solid wrestling, amazing pace, but even better cardio and durability. And although he lacks the, the best striking defense in a lot of times here, he has shown the ability to take shots, as long as you're not flying knees from Edson Barbosa, and continue to push forward and punish his opponents. He is a round two, round three cardio machine who will go out there and look to get late finishes, which is something that's not really the best thing to hear when you are Jesus Zalal Zolal taking this fight on short notice. Zolal is in a second set in the UFC. I've always rated him pretty highly. I mean, he's a guy who I've backed before, um, but a guy who's a primary wrestler. He doesn't have the same volume on the feet, although he's a good counter striker who typically good, does have good cardio. I don't think his volume nor his cardio is on the level of Billy Quarantillo. I do think that Zolal has wrestling upside, but we, we we saw him go to a draw against him on Black Shira, where he did wrestle, uh, where his cardio was tested even more. And I do think when it comes down to the later rounds, the guy who is going to have more left in the tank, the guy who's going to be winning the optics, the guy who has more finish ability and better cardio in the later rounds is Billy Quarantillo. And, and although the wrestling path of victory might be there for Salal, it also might tire him out even more. I really like Billy Q. I missed the line at minus 135. I'll probably end up betting it if it stays around minus 160. He is one of my favorite fighters to back and for very good reason. I don't think Zalal has the control to keep him there and, and not gas out. I, I do think Carolyn is going to make him work and has the durability and cardio to take over as the fight goes on. I'm pretty confident Billy Q. Do with that information what you will. DraftKings wise though, 8.6K, he's one of my favorite plays, but he will also be a very, very chalky option. Quarantillo is a phenomenal drafting scorer. Scored 87 against Jackson, 125 against Hernandez, 141 against Benitez, and 109 against uh, Nelson there. Phenomenal scorer phenomenal pace and for that reason he's someone who you're going to want to have in your lineups i do think he can break so low and score very well in the process the problem is he's going to come with a big ownership and if you're playing single entry that's fine if you're doing uh cash that's fine if you're looking to be different maybe go a bit some maybe go somewhere else here because he is going to be very popular and for good reason Zalal, i think is a perfect way to be contrarian if you don't have quarantillo look at Zalal. he doesn't have the best box scores but his path to victory is rooted in takedown success and controlling quarantillo for 15 minutes and you're gonna need a ton of takedowns to do that, a ton of control time. And that is a very high scoring path to victory. I don't think Talal gets it, but when he does, you're gonna get a ton of leverage on the field and you could have a good opportunity to be unique and score well on drafting because of it. One of my favorite fights to target, I love Billy Q this week, but he does come with a little bit of chalk. Next up, the talk of the town, the seven and oh, Peyton Talbot, nine and one, Cameron Simon. Um, this, is, this, is, this is the fight really. And uh, if you're looking for me to come out here with a strong stance, I don't got one. This is kind of like Dog Gary and Rodriguez for me last week. I might just sit back and watch it because we have two young prospects, 25-year-old Talbot, 23-year-old Simon, who are highly touted and who people think are going to go to the top of this division. Um, I personally haven't always been the highest on them. They've proven me wrong. They've shown they can go out there and, and compete, and they've won me over. And I think in this matchup here, we're getting a very close fight where styles are going to be a bit different. I do think Cameron Simon can compete. I, I do think he is a very good striker, but he's slow to get his reads on the feet. And I do think that Peyton Talbot, although he's also a guy who builds, will start faster and end faster than Cameron Simon on the feet, making the better striker. The X factor here is the grappling of Simon. And although Simon 
isn't a primary wrestler. He has that in his back pocket and he can control people. Peyton Talbot was controlled, although to a although to a decent wrestler last time, that is a sort of red fly to look into. If Peyton Talbot cannot get up from bottom position, Sam is gonna win this fight. But if this fight's a 15 minute kickboxing affair, I very much favor the, the height and reach and volume and durability of Peyton Talbot. He also takes shots better, wins optics. And I think for that reason, he should be able to, to bang a couple of rounds of Simon on and win a decision that way. Either way, super fun fight. Drafting wise though, not a must have. I mean, Talbot went out there and he scored uh, 68 in his debut. That, that's not phenomenal, but he's a guy who's gonna wanna keep this on the feet. He's gonna have a ton of volume and that makes him for a good GP play, but he needs to have a perfect fight fought. That is gonna involve potentially finishing or landing hundreds of strikes to win this matchup. I don't think he is landing takedowns of his own right. I think he needs potential finishes or insane volume to live up to his price tag and ownership. Whereas Simon, although I'm not picking him in this matchup, I think it'll be close. He has shown to score 116, 105, 118 in his wins. He has wrestling upside. And I do think his path to victory has a higher ceiling than Talbot's does. I think if Simon wins, it's going to come with wrestling. It's going to come at a lower ownership, in my opinion. I do think it's going to have a higher ceiling in his own right. So although I'm picking Talbot, give me Talbot as a pick. Give me Simon on DraftKings. Should be a good leverage spot as well. Fun fight, one of my favorite ones on the card, and I'm just excited to see it go down. Oh, we're getting there. 12 and 4, Edmund Shabazian, 7 and 2, AJ Dobson. Um, two guys I've actually been higher on than I should have been. AJ Dobson, the guy who I've backed a few times before, finally paid out for me last time against Tefan Achikwe, but a guy who I do think has good potential, who just hasn't really come into his own. He does have a ton of power, he does have good physicality, but he hasn't really been able to utilize it to the best of his ability recently, but, but he has fought some decent opponents. Speaking of fighting decent opponents, Edmund Shabazian was thrown to the deep end. He gained some high level competition and did exactly as people thought he would. And that was, he got destroyed in a lot of them. But, and then taking a step down against Dolce, he showed that he was still high level. Now getting AJ Dobson, I think it's one of his easiest matchups in a very, very long time. I do think he has a complete skill set to beat AJ Dobson. I think he has good takedown defense. I think he has the way better striking, good power. I do think he should be styling on him for as long as he can. And that's the X factor is can Edmund Shabazian fight his best of abilities for 15 minutes because AJ Dobson has shown to be tough. And although Edmund has insane power, quick hands, good volume, if he can't maintain it for 15 minutes, AJ Dobson has good ground and pound, has power in his own right, and who could threaten him? I'm really being cautious the way I'm wording this because I do think Edmund Shabazi wins this at a high, because I do think Shabazi wins this at a high clip. I just know there's, there are some dangers associated. I only pick Edmund Shabazian. I do think he gets off on a hot start, banks second round, and potentially even gets a finish early on. But the card would be a concern if you want to back AJ Dobson, potentially live bet it. But I do think this is a spot where Shabazian should have him covered in the striking, in the volume, in the optics, having taken a step down from the Jack Romansons and Ema Voss of the world to an AJ Dobson here. So give me Shabazian. I still think he has phenomenal striking, younger fighter of the two, larger frame. Should be a fun fight. It's always dangerous backing Edmund Shabazian, but I do think the golden boy gets back on track here. Fun fight. Comedy event time, 9-1 Carl Williams, 7-3 Justin Taffa. Uh, we had the whole Taffa brother stepping in out of a movie, pretty much, where uh, Junior Taffa stepped in to face Roger de Lima last time against, sorry, in, in place of Justin Taffa, which made for a, a pretty fun dynamic there. But Junior got served, and, and, and Taffa is the supposed big brother, is the guy who has UFC experience. Um, and now it's taking on Carl Williams and, and going from a guy from Roger de Lima to Carl Williams, you think you're getting an easier matchup, but Williams is a larger favorite than de Lima was. So, uh, interesting dynamic. Tafa is the true heavyweight. He will have the incredible advantage on the feet, having a ton of power. He has that one shot knockout power. Whereas Carl Williams has shown that he is a primary grappler. Now he's a guy who's fighting at heavyweight, even though he doesn't have to, winning at 240 last time, but fight wrestles at a high pace, has great cardio. It is more of a decision machine. And this fight is the easiest fight to break down. Justin Taffa has five minutes, maybe even less, to land a knockout below. If not, Carl Williams wins his fight by decision on the mat. Wrestling of Carl Williams, round one power of Taffa. Pick your side. Do you want the round one or bust power striker in Taffa, or do you want the guy who can wrestle for 15 minutes as long as he avoids the power shot? I typically go with these wrestlers, and I think I will here in Carl Williams, but I'm not laying minus 225. It's a pretty dangerous connotation to take a guy who needs to really survive the feat and win a decision. Um, but Tafa has shown he, he if this fight gets out of round one, he can give up positions, he can be destroyed on the mat, and his takedown defense isn't really the best. So give me Carl Williams to avoid those first power shots, take him down, and then take him down over and over again until he wins this fight. I do think Justin Tafa has incredible power, which makes him a, a interesting guy to, to back, especially on DraftKings. This is the fight on DraftKings. This is one you're definitely need to target because Justin Tafa at 6.9K will be a popular option. He, like I said, has round one knockout power. 
William is not the best striker. William can be hit. And when Dafa wins fights, he scored 104, 103, 103, 104. Four wins, four scores above 103, and at 6.9K, you're on the optimal lineup. That is a phenomenal salary. He will be chalk. He has three minutes to do that. I, I do think he can. I don't want to back it too much. I more so think Carl Williams is a good leverage spot as well. He has two wins, averages 100 points in those wins, has shown the ability to go out there and land a ton of takedowns, landed eight against Brent, keep it up 130. That could be a path here for Toffa. I do think he has the ability to dominate on the mat. Shall he survive him? You're taking a very big risk, trusting him at 9.3K, but you're also getting a little bit of leverage over the field. You're getting a very high ceiling in the process. And I do think he is one of my favorite DraftKings plays. As long as he survives the first three minutes, this could make or break it for you in this slate. Very volatile matchup. I'm siding with Williams. Of course, I'll have some Toffa due to his salary and upside, but fun matchup. And then onto the main event, 12 and four, Amanda Rebos, 11 and six, Rose Namajunas. Um, wow, an interesting matchup, an interesting line movement too. That's the first thing we should talk about is Rose Namajunas is now the largest favorite on the card. Thug Rose, after making her her statement performance against Esparza, coming up a weight class, is the biggest favorite on the card. And I, I'm picking her here. I was gonna better if it was minus 160 like she was, but this is a lot of line movement for someone who is unproven at the weight class, who has shown to be at the wrong headspace sometimes. That's the elephant out of the room here. When it comes down to pure skill, Rose is one of the best strikers we've seen. She's fought at a high level. She's proven herself in the UFC, and she has proven the ability to counter wrestle, to counter strike, and land powerful shots. She's a phenomenal fighter. And the funny part about this is Reboss, although she has fought at 125 the, the most recently, her last fight was at 115. She is also a 115 or so they're just two girls who don't want to cut weight in the spot here, um, but still a very, very fun matchup. Reboss is insanely talented herself. A phenomenal ground game, good volume on the feet as well, but doesn't have the same power, doesn't have the same, let's say, precision on the feet or technicality. And her chin is a massive concern as she is maybe one of the chinniest fighters in the female division. Additionally, although Rose is coming up a weight class, she's a big connotation coming up here. Everyone says, oh, she's coming up weight class and she's older here. She's still going to be the taller fighter of the two, and she's still going to be only a year older. So interesting dynamics from this as a whole. And again, I alluded to the whole elephant in the room with the line movement. I still think Rose has not only more finish equity, but also has the ability to be the better striker and win the minutes. Of course, there's a world where Reboss lands takedowns, uh, applies pressure, uses her volume, but we've seen more from Rose. We've seen her go 50, 25 minutes. We've seen her land at a high clip. We've seen her um, take shots before. She is proven at this level, whereas Rebus, I cannot say that as much. Rebus is a phenomenal GPP play. She's a phenomenal uh, potential play, but Rose has 25 minutes to land a power shot. She has 25 minutes to land more damage and outstrike, being the more better technical strike in the Rebus here, making her the favorite. At this price tag, though, it is really tough to back her, but she's still my pick. Draftings wise, though, it's a very interesting dynamic because we've alluded to the phenomenal upside of a Carl Williams or Bailey Quarantillo. Like, there's going to be some high scores on the slate. Can you afford Rose at 9.2? Line value says, well, she's the biggest favorite on the card. You probably want her, but she has shown the ability to score only 80 points in a five rounder. She also got the ability to score 118 points in a five rounder, but nonetheless has shown to be sometimes slower volume. And I think that she is not a must play at this price tag. I still think she's a, a, a solid option. I think she'll land volume, has finish upside. She's an also okay play, but she's not a must play. Reboss at 7K is another one of these underdogs that just has a ton of upside. You know, she has finish upside on the mat. She has incredible volume. If her pace can hold up, she's shown the ability to fight at a high pace. She's also a very interesting option at 7K. And I do think she's someone I'll be targeting, especially having a five round ability in a fight that's favored to go the distance. So all this to say is, although I'm picking Rose, there are some wide lines. This is not a must play on DraftKings. And actually Reboss is a very, very level underdog in her own right, but Interesting matchup that I do think Nama Junior should be favored in. Maybe not this much. I'm picking Thug Rose. Hope she gets back in her winning ways. And, and hopefully she's able to put up a big enough drafting score to live up to her 9.2k salary. But that's going to do it for me here on the Plays and Fades YouTube channel. Let me quickly give you my quick picks. Taking Rose Nama Junis, Thug Rose getting back on track. Taking Carl Williams, Edmund Shabazian, Peyton Talbot, Billy Quarantillo, Fernando Padilla, Trey Ogden, Julian Arosa, Cody Gibson, Steve Nguyen, Daria Zed. Igor Severino and Mick Parkin. Drafting wise, very, very fun slate. Let me first start off with that any of the underdogs are live. I mean, completely all of them are live doing this fight and all of them have a potential to score very well. Salary could be off the table this week because you have Tafa, 6.9K, who has 110 point upside with a first round KO win. You have Reboss, who has a five rounds to work against an opponent who she could have some success against. You have AJ Dobson fighting an inconsistent fighter, Shabazian. And you have Igor Severino, a guy picking to win outright 
at 7.2K who has good pace, pressure, and ground upside. Not even to mention the, the Juliana Rosas or the Pajelos or the Holobows who all have finished upside underdog as well. Bring down per fight, fights I want to target, Williams versus Top will make or break it. Lima Severino is also very high level fight to target. Padilla Puello could be fought at high pace. Quarantillo Zalal is also a great one. And those are really the four I'm targeting the most. By section, Williams, Rose, Edmund up top. Those are the big three. In the mid range, which is really where I want to live this week, Quarantillo is my favorite, but I also love Padilla. I think uh, I think Ramos has round one upside. And those three are really what I'm targeting the most. Underdog wise, there's a thousand. I think I, I make a case for all of them, but my favorite ones. Cody Gibson, 8K. I think he's a ton of upside. Cameron Simon, even though I'm not picking him, has a ton of upside, 7.9K. Arosa and Severino are maybe my two favorite underdogs just because they're so cheap, have so much finish upside and pace upside, and having the highest seals on the slate. This is not a card where I have feel too confident. This may be more of a GPP card for me, but there are many opportunities. Let me further elaborate by saying my favorite leverage plays this week are Yusef Zalal. Even though I'm picking Quarantillo and he's my favorite play on the slate, Zalal is great leverage this week. It could be a bit different. Simon over Talbot and Randon if she grapples. Finally, ranking my favorite GPP upside guys of the entire slate were now Quarantillo, Williams, Gibson, Orosa. And let's give you a top five. Simon, also pretty good GPP as well. Whew, a lot of DraftKings talk. Rainmakers wise, a highest in the entire slate Williams, Quarantillo, Gibson, Padilla, Shabazian. Betting wise, nothing locked in yet, but I'll probably play Billy Q if I can. I, I want to have money on the guy. Mick Parker, if his line stays the same. Cody Gibson at plus money. And potentially looking for unders and other matchups as well. With all that out of the way, with all my talking done today, hopefully you guys have gained enough insight to succeed in your DraftKings and betting endeavors. I appreciate everybody for tuning in. Hit the like button down below. Subscribe to the channel. Make sure you're back for next week where we have another phenomenal slate. We're trying to make some money on it. And all accumulating to this big UFC 300. Make sure to check out Established to Run where I do premium content there, as well as the cool bet best bets video that will be up later this week. And with that, guys, best of luck at UFC Vegas 89. Let's make some money.